technically, Roman history is, uh, consists of three divisions. Um, and I'm giving you approximate dates. So, uh, in the 8th century, about in the middle of the 8th century, uh, technically, Rome was founded. In fact, there was a dwelling long before that, of course. And, but from that date, for about 250 years, it was a kingdom. It began with Romulus, then various Latin kings. Uh, we we suppose, supposedly know that the first kings, the first three kings were Latin, and the last three kings were Etruscan. And that's what we were talking about last time. But the uh, last Etruscan king, uh, Tarquinus Superbus, was ejected. Um, in the year 509, 510, let's, let's just call it the year 500. So from the year 500 till the year 31 BC, or let's just call it the zero. From the year 500 to the year zero BC, that was a republic. Rome functioned as a republic. It, de it developed republican institutions. Um, it had a republican constitution as well. It was not a democratic republic. It was an aristocratic republic, representative. It was not a direct republic as, uh, as in Athens, Greece, the direct democracy. So the republic, the first 500 years, then as of approximately the year zero until 500 AD, Anno Domini, uh, it will be an empire and then it will end the Western portion. So we're talking about a thousand years of Roman history. The first 500 years, republic, the second 500 years, empire. The thing to remember also is that the empire itself, the physical empire, land possessions, were in fact acquired during the Republic. And uh, so in terms of possessions, things will not change much after the year zero, but the government will be different because it will just, will have a king again, essentially, an emperor. So uh, let's see where we are. Here's our Italy right here, and we looked at the Etruscans before. The Etruscans were to the north of uh, Rome, the uh, Greeks were to the south of Rome, and then sometime in the beginning of the uh, second century AD, uh, Rome will be like this. It must have been an extraordinary sight to behold. Uh, the very first emperor, Emperor Augustus, uh, once said that he found Rome uh, built up of brick, and he left it built up of marble. But the building will continue after him as well. And it is true that uh, while the uh, Romans were too busy uh, conquering, Rome itself grew very uh, hopscotch. It, was, it, it did not have uh, a specific town planning. And we'll be talking about town planning uh, today as well. And uh, most of the buildings were, in fact, in brick. And, but also, they will, uh, they will uh, discover cement. Cement means tiny little stones in, um, in Latin, and we'll talk about that as well. But, however, there were no great buildings. Uh, and uh, not only that, unfortunately, not too many remained from the Republican period. Uh, many more remained from the Imperial period, of course. How in, in, in a dreadful condition, but remained, nevertheless, to a large degree thanks to cement. So as you see here, this, is, um, this, this was a tremendous city. Visitors from other parts were awestruck when they saw Rome, and it was fed by aqueducts, so it had plentiful supply of water. Ultimately, it will have something like a hundred bathhouses, whether private houses or public houses, libraries, uh, popular popular gathering places, a number of forums, which is which were originally, as I said, marketplaces, but then they became uh, social gathering places, and also places where offices were held, etc. Uh, the so this is I mean we're looking at the the ultimate Rome. We're looking at Rome in the early uh, second century A.D. However, in its original state, say 800 B.C., this presumably what it looked like. Uh, this is the model of the village of Romulus on the Palatine Hill. So, you remember last time we were talking about Romulus presiding over the abduction of the Sabine, uh, Sabine women. Um, 
but and uh, and someone like Nicolas Poussin uh, drew this spectacular painting, this spectacular buildings. The buildings were in fact like this, and um, it was on a Palatin Hill. Uh, they were they were just uh, wattle huts, essentially. Here's just another representation of what the uh, what those houses may have looked like. Um, the, the Latins, remember, were just one of the tribes. There were all sorts of other tribes around, and uh, not to mention the Etruscans to the north and the uh, Greeks to the south. And uh, and over time, the Latins and the other tribes just uh, melded together, essentially, into something that will be Rome. So these are the huts. Now, fast forward into the time when they actually began to to build. And their first builders were Etruscans because the Etruscans were in fact invited to build, as you remember, the Temple of Jupiter on the Capitoline Hill. And the original temples looked very much uh, like the Etruscan temples. Now, um, one of the temples that has survived, uh, and uh, this, uh, this temple in fact comes from uh, 75, uh, uh, B.C. It's already the first century. As I said, not many survived. Well, nothing survived really from, from say the third or the fourth century B.C. Uh, because they were still built in mud brick and wood, so nothing survived. Whereas this temple in the first century B.C. Rome by this time has spread all around the Mediterranean and has become wealthy and is now building in stone. Uh, so the one temple that we have is this, uh, the temple of um, uh, Portunus. Portunus from Porta uh, is the god of the harbors. Another name this temple has is Fortuna Virilis, the temple of fortune for those who came into port. Uh, this temple is in Rome. It's sitting right on the Tiber. I did compare an Etruscan temple to the uh, Greek temple last time, but let's just uh, repeat it. So as you see, what you see in this temple is a porch and a cellar. Uh, the columns themselves, these are on, only the front columns here are functional. In other words, they hold, they hold the weight of the portico right here. Whereas in the Greek temple, the columns went all around the temple. And so did, and so did the steps. In other words, in a Greek temple, if you look from the front or from the back, there wasn't much of a difference, whereas that was not the case with the Etruscan temples and then Roman temples. The columns, the functional columns, were only in the front. And then when they, they, they did begin to introduce the idea of a column going around, they were not functional, they were decorative, they were engaged columns. So this is our temple of Fortunity Realis, and this is called the elevation, just the, uh, the view of uh, uh, of a structure, either from the front, from the back, from, from inside, uh, what the structure consists of. And that's what's called elevation. And this elevation consists of steps, as you see, ionic columns, the pediment. Whereas here, the elevation consists, again, of the base, right there, and then ionic columns, and, uh, and the, the, the roof, the side of the roof. Uh, Greek temples, you see, they, they sort of, they were like huge, enormous sculptures sitting on a base that could be looked at from all sides. And the majority of Greek temples were built, in fact, with the, with the idea of being looked at from any side, like a sculpture. Another stunning building from the Republic, presumably, uh, is, uh, is a temple that looks very much like the temple of Fortuna Virilis. But this one is in the south of France, in Nîmes, where uh, Romans were masters. And uh, while the Fortuna Virilis had the Ionic columns, as you see here, and you remember the Corinthian Ionic Doric order. Here, this, this uh, Maison Carré has the Corinthian columns right there. It's larger and uh, more grandiose than the uh, Fortuna Virilis, but the idea still is very much the same. Here, what it presumably looked like uh, at the, in, in the first century BC, the, the Romans, just as the Greeks did, uh, they loved porticos, colonnaded porticos, that, uh, where the roof would hide them either from sun or from rain, and where they would meet, discuss, uh, socialize. So most of these temples were surrounded by these kind of porticos. 
this also is the, the roof actually, this is uh, a 19th century reconstruction, but uh, this is what it looks like, uh, the Maison Carré, that's what it looks like at night. We'll, in fact, we'll talk about this kind of roof, it's called coffered roofing, uh, so the uh, the ceiling is, is made in these um, intricate, uh, beautiful designs, whether square, whether square or octagonal, um, that that give interest to to the design, and but but also lighten the structure. The Romans loved an arc or an arch. Uh, the uh, I mentioned it last time that the, the Greek architecture was um, were uh, was pretty much two posts and a lintel, whereas Romans loved the arch. And just for us to know, the arch consisted of these stones, with these trapezoid stones, they're called voussoirs. In the middle was a keystone, and the voussoirs, because, because of, the, uh, because of the, the pressure against one another, essentially held uh, themselves. Um, the centering was first uh, made of wood, and then around the centering, an arch was built, right here. And as you see, the Barrel vaulting, which also which Romans also love. Barrel vaulting is essentially an extended arch. That's what barrel vaulting is. It's very heavy. The vault, as you see, the pressures go down from the vault from, uh, from the from the vault onto the walls, and they tend to break the walls to push the walls aside. Therefore, the walls have to be extremely heavy in order to hold the barrel vaulting. And then when you place the two vaults into one another, cross one another, you get the groin bolt. And that's what this is, the groin bolt. And there were wonderful advantages to the groin bolt because uh, all the uh, stress was directed into the massive piers, but the space around was open, you see, for the light or, uh, or the people to, to go through. So that's the basis of the, uh, of the Roman structure. Uh, the one thing that the Romans developed, which was um, extraordinary, which was brilliant, which is really one of the reasons so many, uh, well, the remnants of their structures still remain above ground, above foundations, they developed cement and, uh, and the, or the Roman concrete. It was based on the hydraulic, and it was hydraulic setting cement, which petrifies underwater, which was fantastic for the aqueducts, especially when the aqueducts, uh, when, the, uh, when the ducts were built under, um, underground or in water, the cement solidified. That cement solidified in, um, in water. And it was incredibly durable because of the incorporation of volcanic ash, which prevented cracks from, from spreading. We don't exactly know when they came up with this brilliant idea, presumably uh, sometime in the middle of the second century BC, but it's possible that it was even earlier. We have the descriptions of Roman cement from, I mentioned the man before, the architect Vitruvius, who lived um, in the first century BC and left us 10 books on architecture where he describes various methods. And he recommends uh, different uh, aggregates for different purposes because um, the mortar itself, the lime mortar, the porcelana, then could be mixed with this embedded little with tiny stones, but the stones could either come from, say, very light stone, porous, something like tufa, and then the cement, the, the whole structure would be lighter, or you could mix in bits of granite, in which case it would be much stronger uh, for, for, for foundations. So cement was an amazing invention because, well, for, for one thing, it was so, so much less expensive than, uh, than the, the actual stone. It didn't need um, uh, dressing. Uh, it could be uh, molded in, uh, in well in uh, in forms, and uh, uh, with something like a barrel bolt that we saw before, the whole thing could in fact be done off cement, and or an arch because an arch depends on these voussoirs. But if you pick one out, the whole arch may fall apart. Whereas with the cement, that wasn't the case any longer because it, it was like one, one very, very powerful structure. The one, uh, the one disadvantage, of course, is that it was not attractive on the outside, but that uh, the Romans uh, dealt with that by dressing, by dressing the cement with either brick or, or marble or other stones or plaster, in fact, uh, that uh, was, was later treated like, uh, and made look like marble. So cement was, uh, 
it was a tremendous invention that uh, they use it everywhere. So this is our arch, our arc, and the barrel vault. It could be manipulated as you see, it could be twisted, and then the arch is turned on itself. It could be made into a dome. So there are all these structural schemes could be uh, done, definitely with masonry, which is uh, which are which are treated which are stones, but then much better with cement. Uh, what this used to be is the so-called Porticus Emilia, and the reason it's called Porticus Emilia is because it was built by two members of the Emilia family. These were warehouses. There were warehouses right there on the Tiber where the ships would dock and then uh, discharge their their cargo or take on the cargo and uh, these warehouses were incredibly extensive as you see here and the way they were built because the uh, the site is slightly mountainous so it was built in steps as you see and ingeniously each step each roof had the so-called clerestory windows right there the clerestory windows up above the roof of the preceding building so the light could come into the buildings and all around there were shops, warehouses, offices, what have you. It was a very busy port. And uh, so these are just a couple of examples uh, that you might be interested in. And it is the earliest known use of concrete on a grand scale. Barrel vaulting was also used throughout in concrete. And the reason these windows could, in fact, as you see, be, be cut through was because uh, because the cement structure was a solid monolithic one one may say structure in which if you if you cut through uh, trying to make a window it would it would not uh, weaken the structure as it would in masonry here is um, just a, a larger scheme for you to see so as you see there are windows here when these are called the clerestory windows and uh, the the whole thing was was monumental in size Today, this is what we have left of, uh, of that structure, and then Rome, of course, is above it. Um, and now we come back to the Roman Forum, which is not very far from the Tiber. And it is, uh, uh, in fact, here's the, uh, the Tiber is right there, as you see here. These are our seven hills. This is the Forum. I showed this uh, slide to you before, the Forum again is a marketplace. As the city grew and expanded and uh, trade, they traded in salt at first, but then this, this surrounding tribes would also come there to exchange the goods and, and then certain, certain buildings with time were necessary, temples were necessary, official buildings, all of those were built around the Roman Forum, the original Roman Forum. And because at that point it sort of grew organically without any particular method, any particular scheme, uh, the Roman Forum today, and one could, it's, it's open to the public, uh, presents a rather mishmash area of, uh, of buildings and, and ruins because it was not methodical as the later forums will be. And um, so here it is. It's really located between, here's the Capitoline and the Palatine Hill, and that's where it is. This is what it looks like today, and I'll try to explain what buildings are where as we go along. This is the Capitoline Hill. This is the, uh, uh, the uh, Victoria Emanuele building that we had seen. Uh, this building, in fact, was used, the site, was used by the Romans for one of their buildings as well. This arch is a later, a second century AD arch of Septimus Severus. It was built considerably later. And um, on, this is this is the Senate House, right there. This what this is this is, these, are, these are the recreations of the Roman Forum at its height and how it truly looked like and what beautiful buildings there were there, here and here. So. There we have it, and this is the, when we look at these ruins. That's what we see. The uh, that's what we see. These buildings right here. Here they are, and this is what it is. What what's there today? Today these are museums, the Capitol museums, and from the museums there's a spectacular view on the forum. And the forum, as I said, was um, was the center of life. 
and we'll talk about the forum uh, more as we as uh, as the course progresses because as I said at first it was there was really not much there. In fact, even with the um, excavation of the forum, archaeologists have problems because one can dig further and further and further. There's so many levels, um, and of course the. Uh, the marketplace uh, at the time of Romulus and Remus, or even uh, at the times of the First Republic, was was very primitive. Was uh, is, was very simple. I mean, it's like an open market anywhere uh, in the countryside. And so, what you see here, the ruins that you see here, are the result of the later building uh, during the first century B.C. and during the first two centuries A.D. So, and we'll look at it, as I said, when we, when we cover those centuries. It's difficult in terms of construction to talk about these very early centuries because we just don't have, we don't have much. Um, uh, the, um, just to show you the use of concrete and, uh, and the tremendous constructions that the Romans did, uh, they inherited from the Greeks the idea of a, the of a, of a theater. Uh, but just as with the Greeks, so with the Romans, theatrical performances were not secular. They were, they were part of religious, um, religious rites and religious festivals that could last for months. And as such, uh, the Greeks at first, but then the Romans, uh, that uh, took the Greek ideas and expanded them tremendously. Uh, made these extraordinary structures that incorporated uh, temples and incorporated, so they incorporated religious worship and social interaction and theatrical performances all in these enormous, I can't even think of anything that anything similar that, that, that we would have. When I think of the Lincoln Center, uh, but that's all, you see, that, that's all secular pretty much. Whereas for the Romans, they very much incorporate the religion with it. So this, for instance, uh, the case here in Tivoli, which is not far from Rome, and uh, so the temple would sit at the very top, and then around the temple again you have these porticos. It's the same porticos that we saw in Maison Carré, and the porticos would have shops, and they would have libraries, and they may have meeting places. There may be an occasional bathhouse there. Uh, it had everything that was needed by uh, the contemporary society for. A full life, and then the theater here, as you see, here is a, here is another another picture. So you can see the uh, uh, the theater there, the temple here, porticos around. Now a road came from Rome. Here's the road. The road came from Rome, went directly underneath that whole structure. Because what the what the Romans did here, they took a hill uh, in Tivoli, and they flattened it out, uh, and supported it all these incredible cement, concrete barrel bolts, which, which, which could support incredible, extraordinary weight. So the road went right underneath and out. And there was a whole world underneath the, um, underneath the floor here. This is where the road came in. This is the road came in, went out there. And then as you see the floor of the, uh, the temple floor, was pierced with the skylights so that the light would go through and then everywhere there there were three stories of um, uh, boutiques, shops, as I said, offices, what have you and then on top there was a temple and of course um, and of course the theater the, um, what, and, it, and this now, this structure was pretty much built entirely of concrete with, of course, it was all faced. It would be faced with uh, with marble, or it would be faced with plaster, uh, made look like uh, like marble. But otherwise, this is we, we still have these structures here. They have been renovated, as you see. But this is what's left today. And these engaged columns, they are Doric columns. And what you see here, uh, what's left of all these um, of all these structures. It was quite tremendous. Now, uh, here, temple, theater, porticos, taberna. Taberna is a shop, like, like a tavern. Um, it was all in there. It, was, it, it could accommodate an enormous amount of people. But an even larger one was um, in, uh, in, in Palestrina, also today not very far from Rome. And this one was uh, 
on a truly, truly gigantic scale. Uh, the temple was right there, over there, the tholos. The little tholos gave onto the countryside, which was extremely beautiful. Porticos were everywhere. And, and then the road went through. These ramps led right up. This is the theater. So the theater could be accessed either through the barrel vaulting passages or up the, uh, the stairs and down. So, but there were staircases everywhere. So one could go around in, in many ways. It's, again, as I said, it's, it's hard to imagine what it was, but just think of, even, even though it was built in cement, but yet it, was, it could be faced either with marble or mosaic or, uh, again, plastered, made to look like marble. And mosaics were everywhere. Color was everywhere. Uh, the ancients loved color. They loved beauty. They were not, uh, they were not minimalists in, in, any, in any way or form. And so everything was covered with mosaics and marble and color. It was spectacular. It was truly just spectacular. This, for instance, uh, is a mosaic found in um, Palestrina, and it's called the Nile Mosaic. It's enormous. It's, uh, as you see, it's 20 by 14 feet. So this is 14 feet by 20 feet. And it shows uh, it meticulously the Nile when uh, the Nile rises every every autumn. The Nile would rise for three months and then go down. And when it rose, it brought all the nutrients from the middle of the African continent and deposit the nutrients. Then, as it receded, uh, it was the most fertile topsoil that could ever be found. And this is this shows the Nile as it rises and the activity around the Nile, endless. Uh, animals there, giraffes and uh, hippopotami and uh, full sail flowing around. I mean, it's, it's really, really intricate. I can, I can spend a day just studying the, the mosaic. But this is all we have left, whereas, um, whereas they were everywhere. The whole place was just covered in it. The shape, as you see here, the shape, the, uh, kind, the kind of flattened uh, semicircle indicated that this mosaic was probably in an apse. So uh, uh, apse is, well, as in today's churches. Uh, is a semicircular uh, structure at the end of, or on the side of a hole. So that's what that was about. Um, this is what it looks like today. This, of course, is Prime Minister today, or Palestrina. And uh, we have just the, uh, uh, the remnants of, the, uh, of that complex that we're looking at. Uh, it, is, it was also there in uh, Palestrina, in that complex, that uh, the first use of coffers I showed you the coffered ceiling in Maison Carré in, uh, in Nîmes, in the south of France. Here they are. They're used here, the coffers. You can see them better. These are square and these are octagonal. In a, this is a later building, but you can see these coffers. They were used uh, for both purposes, a decorative purpose, of course, but also to lighten the vaulting. And they too would be decorated very beautifully, maybe with the rosette inside uh, and the rosette uh, would be gilded. It was all very, very lovely. So as I said, Rome, uh, original Rome, grew very haphazardly because it grew very organically. It sort of didn't expect, or she, should I call Rome she, uh, it didn't expect for, for it to grow as fast as it did. Well, fast, over, over centuries nevertheless. But the real growth, growth began from the end of the fourth century on. And uh, more people came to the city, and the city grew tremendously, and grew also without any method. However, everywhere else, once the Romans began to, to march around the Mediterranean uh, and in their conquests, and once they began to found uh, other towns, and, and also once they began to set up military camps, now those were very methodical. And those were done according to the um, uh, to a very rectilinear plan, and the, the town planning was very very important. So uh, the military camps were done on the rectilinear plan, and then when the soldiers retired, uh, the colonies would be founded for them, where they too would live in these very uh, methodically planned cities and very rationally planned cities. That doesn't mean that after a while these cities would also not grow out in, uh, in, in, in a haphazard way because, I mean, uh, the perfection is difficult to maintain uh, and uh, even something that just 
just think of our closets, for instance. Uh, one day we decide that we really need to, to know where things are. We, we go into the closet, we organize the entire closet. Ah, fantastic, you know where everything is. But then, uh, you know, half a year later, <laughs> it will again turn into what it was in the first place because uh, we just don't maintain it. But these cities still exist, but the, you can see in the middle of these cities that how, how very uh, rectilinear they are and rational they are. Now, as the Romans moved around, and, uh, and that included northern, uh, northern Africa, the southern Mediterranean, we're going to go to the city of Timgad, right there in, in Algeria. Look what is happening here. Everything is done on a very rectilinear plan. And then there would be two, two central streets. I mean, if the town is bigger, there would be more larger streets. But, but in, the, in the beginning, there would be two very central streets. Uh, one would be called Cardo, the other Decomanos. Cardo would be north to south, south to north, and then Decomanos, uh, east to west. Think of Europe. Uh, Europe is shorter south to north, so that's Cardo, a shorter word, and it's longer. Uh, east to west, and that's Decumanus, a longer word. And in the middle of these two main streets would be a forum, would be the place, the meeting place of the town. And then somewhere in the town there would always be baths. Uh, the, the Romans valued bathing very much. There would be a theater, and this time also an amphitheater. So when you look here at the uh, at Timgad, it just looks, it, it's a perfect, uh, uh, illustration of how these towns were built. Uh, these, uh, it's all rectilinear. Then there would be a, an arch, a triumphal arch. Here is a theater. This is the schematic of just just the module of the uh, of the original uh, Roman planning. And this is the Cardo and Decumanus. These are the uh, uh, north, south, and east, west streets. And then around here. Uh, as I said, they would, they would have uh, the market, Mercado, and, uh, and the forum, and the amphitheater, a theater would be here. Um, so it would be very easy to find oneself in these, uh, in these towns. Today, um, because the Romans went everywhere, including Spain, of course, and one finds oneself, uh, this is the town of Almagro in Spain, for instance, where Don Quixote uh, had his sway. And when you look at Almagro, you, you walk around Almagro and suddenly well, you, you feel as if you, are, you really are in uh, ancient Pompeii that, uh, or an ancient Roman city that was just not destroyed, or an ancient Timgad. But as you see here uh, in, uh, in Almagro, the cities will turn after a while. We are coming to the ancient Pompeii that I just mentioned. It was also, it was not originally a Roman city. It was, uh, uh, it was the, the Oski, the tribe of the Oski, the, the tribe of the Samnites um, uh, that founded the city. But, uh, but the dictator, Roman dictator Sulla, uh, would ultimately uh, take over these, um, these lands in the year 80 BC and refound the city as a Roman colony. And at first, it was also organized on this uh, rectilinear plan. Um, now, we were just talking about Spain. So you remember that the Romans went to Spain, so they founded these cities uh, uh, in Spain, the colonies. And then, and then, of course, a couple of thousand years later, the Spaniards went to South America. And in South America, they also founded cities. And those cities were done according to the same plan, to the Roman plan. So before we go to Pompeii, I just want to show you, this is for instance in, uh, uh, this is the, the town of Antigua in Guatemala, and this is Antigua today, and this is what it looks like, and it has its own volcano, the Picaya volcano. This is the ancient Pompeii. Today, today of course, this is what it looks like, but it looked like this before. This is the ancient Pompeii with its own volcano, which, uh, which is Vesuvius, which erupted in the autumn, uh, in August or maybe September, October, we, we're not quite sure at this point, of the year 79 AD and covered the city entirely, which was of course a tremendous catastrophe for the inhabitants of the time. It also became an extraordinary boon for the archaeologists and historians of today. 
because uh, the city was covered entirely and as a result entirely preserved. And uh, there's no space uh, in the world, there's no spot in the world where such richness of material is available for study of the ancient world as, uh, as Pompeii. But this I'm just comparing the Antigua today and uh, Pompeii and uh, you feel as if you're walking around Pompeii. And this is what Antigua looks like, you see. And it's still, it's done on that same plan. So in the center of the city today, of course, you'd find not a temple, you'd find a church. But the idea is the same. And there's Guatemala right here. So uh, to Pompeii, we now go. And Pompeii is located in the Bay of Naples. There's, there's Italy, so it's right here. Um, there's the Mount Vesuvius. Pompeii and Naples is here. So the two cities, Pompeii and Herculaneum, were covered by the uh, eruption of the mountain. This is a painting by a 19th century Russian painter by the name of Karl Brilov. And uh, this is very imaginary. It came, in fact, um, to the West. Uh, it was exhibited in the West and it was so influential that on seeing the painting, uh, Edward Bulwer-Lytton, who was uh, a politician, an aristocrat, a writer, uh, English, uh, wrote the book, a very famous book called The Last Days of Pompeii. Pompeii was discovered in the 18th century and the excavations still go on and, uh, and in fact three quarters of it is still not excavated. But um, as, uh, as the uh, archaeologists were cutting through the petrified pumice, they noticed that there were these strange lacunae, the empty spaces inside, uh, inside the, the stone, and, um, and they suddenly they realized that those spaces were where people died or animals died. And then the flesh deteriorated, uh, leaving the lacuna inside. So what they began to do is uh, inject plaster into these lacuna. And as a result, they were able to come up with these extraordinary plastic casts. And in some of them, interestingly enough, the teeth were still, were still there. And uh, uh, they're really, I mean, they're not alarming, but... Uh, uh, to, to look at them is, um, is uncomfortable. It shows how people died at the very moment of, uh, of the disaster and how death sometimes, when it, when it did take them instantaneously, uh, the position in which they died. And it's not just the people, but uh, here's a dog, for instance. Uh, as you see, there was, uh, there was the original idea of the rectilinear shape, but then, uh, well, first of all, there was another town there in the first place. And, um, and then secondly, again, as the town grew, it went into all sorts of uh, directions. But you can see that this is, uh, uh, this is the Cardo, and it had actually a couple of decumanuses. This is the Forum, right here, and then the theater is here, and then the amphitheater. Amphitheater, we'll talk about it, it means double theater. And the Greeks didn't know this structure, the Greeks only knew theater which is a semicircle, sometimes a little more than a semicircle, but then um, the Romans needed a larger space and a more enclosed uh, arena for their gladiatorial games. So they took two theaters and put them together and came up with the Yankee Stadium, which is an amphitheater. Amphi means double, such as amphibious creature lives, uh, uh, lives underwater and above. Uh, so when you see, uh, when you hear someone talking about uh, the amphitheater, when it's only half the theater, they're wrong. The amphitheater, as you see, is here. And uh, we'll go, right now, we'll go to the Forum of Pompeii. This is the, the uh, original part. This is the oldest part of the, uh, uh, of the city. And then as the city grew, you see, it grew on a more uh, rectilinear pattern. And, uh, and every block of buildings was uh, called insula. Right there. But this is the, uh, the original, the Samnit settlement that the Romans then rebuilt. Uh, the, um, and here it is again. Here's our amphitheater. They have two theaters actually. And this is our forum. And behind the forum there were baths. And you can see where everything is located here. All around, by the way, all those areas are still not excavated because the Pompeii was larger than this. Again, reconstruction, uh, go to Antigua, uh, just your, 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 your typical street, and this is the forum. Now, this forum now, unlike the Roman forum, 
is methodical. And again, it has a portico around, and the porticos uh, would have places for meeting, uh, or tabernae, or, or offices, and then uh, a temple of Jupiter at the very end. Here it is, as it is today, with the temple of Jupiter. This is the temple of Apollo, and this is a basilica. Uh, now, a basilica in the Roman world was, uh, and not a religious building, it was, uh, uh, it was a building for, again, for meeting. It could be, uh, it could be a shopping center, in fact. Uh, it could be like Quaker like Bridge Mall, for instance. Or it could be a building where, uh, where the, the law courts were assembled. And in fact, in this particular basilica in Pompeii, that was the place where the law courts assembled. But it was also just a place where one can walk in, hide from the sun, hide from the rain, conduct business, the Romans usually conducted their business in the morning, and then uh, in the afternoon they would always go to the baths, and, uh, and then to dinner from the baths, etc. So all the business was conducted in the morning. Their, their, their work day was not long. Um, so this is what, and these are all the buildings around that one can just uh, uh, stroll around. Here it is. The municipal offices, here's the Basilica, Temple of Apollo, Temple of Jupiter, and now there, there was a market here, uh, public toilets, granary. Sometimes we're not quite sure what was there, but uh, we just take the best guess that uh, we can possibly take. The Temple of Jupiter, here as you see the, the original, uh, the same sort of Etruscan model, uh, presumably Corinthian, with the steps going all the way up, uh, statues around. There would be Acroteria. Uh, as well, and these are all the porticos, and some of them are the double-storied porticos, and then around there would be, I mean, people walking around, meeting together, saying hello to one another. There would be uh, lined up with statues of the gods, very colorful. Here it is, here's what presumably it would look like. Uh, so this would be the Temple of Jupiter, as you see, and this is the Temple of Apollo, right there, and this is the, uh, this is the Basilica. And it's the oldest known basilica in the Roman world. And this will then evolve into the Christian architecture. So today, when we hear basilica, we associate it with a religious building. But it wasn't originally the case. So this is the basilica. So the, uh, uh, and uh, the, except for the Temple of Apollo, where the, en the entrance was from the street over there into the temple. Otherwise, everywhere, entrances were from the form it itself. So the origin of the basilica is is a Greek store, which is a portico. Again, uh, think of the uh, the front. This is, I mean, the uh, the uh, portico right there. Uh, the Greeks, in fact, built these porticos as an individual buildings where, again, they met, where they exercised, where they conducted the businesses. It's just a very convenient covered place, uh, away from the sun, away from the rain, and that's how it all began. And then, and, and it was roofed, obviously. But then out of that grew more complex buildings. In fact, all these porticos that you see here, they also, uh, they were originally, they came out uh, inspired by Greek constructions. And so is the basilica. It's essentially a, a long store covered by a roof. So here it is, it had, the, it had the columns in the middle, right? It's a long space. At the end, there was a tribunal because this was used as a law court and people conducted businesses there and engaged columns all around. Yeah. Here you can see it. There are the engaged Ionic columns, whereas the inside, the, uh, it's called the peristyle, remember the columns all around, they were presumably Corinthian uh, columns, and this is the tribunal uh, that was raised above. And it was a double story from what we see. This is an attempt at recreation of the basilica, so the Corinthian columns, the peristyle of the Corinthian columns. I mean, think of, uh, yeah, think of the churches. And then on the side aisles, there would be engaged columns right there, here. Uh, over there you can see that. And then at the end of the basilica, the, the ceiling would be a timber ceiling. And of course, timber ceilings, the problem with them is that, you know, they, they, they catch fire. And then at the end, the tribunal. So that was one very important public building. And then uh, other very important public buildings were the baths. Now, the Roman baths 
were extremely important. And public baths could be uh, uh, could be used for very little money. And one and and they if there were democratic institutions in, in in Rome, so those were public public baths because that's where a plebeian and uh, and uh, I mean a commoner and an aristocrat uh, could uh, they, they were both using the facilities. I, I, needless to say that. Uh, um, in, in, in truly wealthy houses, especially outside of Rome, then uh, uh, houses could have their own private baths. But, uh, but otherwise, uh, people went to the public baths. Also, it was a social thing. Uh, bathing by oneself was not fun. Uh, one, all one went to the baths also to socialize. Uh, and uh, so as you see here, uh, Pompeii would have about half a dozen baths. And these are Stabian baths. Uh, and so the palaestra right here, was an exercise uh, area, where people, and uh, and then there would be a where's the pool? There would there, there would be a pool here. Uh, well, there's a swimming pool, and then uh, it would consist of caldarium, tepidarium, and frigidarium. Then the frigidarium would be very cold water. I mean, typically a person would go to a tepidarium first, where with with, with the tepid water, and then from there into uh, uh, caldarium, very 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 hot, hot water and, 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 and sometimes steaming, and from there jump into, into a cold pool, into a frigidarium. Uh, in this particular, uh, in these baths, you would have women's uh, and, and men's uh, quarters. In other baths, there, there, there may be time, different times. Men would be allotted a certain time, and then the women would be allotted a, a different time. But then in others, as I said, there would be different quarters. And the baths, again, uh, were a great uh, place for socializing. And really great baths in Rome would have libraries and they would have meeting places again. And, uh, uh, and they would have cafes and restaurants. They were truly just the, uh, the areas of social interaction, great areas of social interaction. And uh, they were a very, very important part of, uh, uh, of, a, of a day in the life of a Roman. Uh, here is a recreation of a palestra. Boxing, wrestling were all important sports. Here is the recreation of, uh, uh, of, of a pool. Uh, and, and some of the spaces, again, were absolutely spectacular, covered with marble and statuary and, of course, mosaics. Uh, the Romans took their bathing very, very seriously. This is the pool, this is the pool, the, uh, this is turned. Uh, and you can look later at, uh, at, at, at how uh, the place was arranged. Uh, these were the women quarters here, right? And then the men's quarters. And this is the central palaestra. Uh, here it is. This is just the plan of the baths, uh, the pool, the, the, the warm room, the hot room, here, yeah, all of those. Uh, the uh, Domenico Morelli uh, in 19th century, 19th century was absolutely fascinated with classical culture and, um, and the artists tried to recreate to see what those places looked like and this would be the uh, change room or apoditerium uh, uh, the, in, in the women's quarters. And today you go into, into the remnants of these baths and, and, and you see, you see the, lock, the, the lockers, so to speak, the, the niches where clothes were left and then you can see how people then proceeded in, um, into various rooms of the bath. And the baths were heated in a very ingenious device between, from between, uh, underneath the floor and between the walls. Uh, furnaces uh, worked uh, full force. And, and sent a hot air under the floor, and the floor was raised on brick stilts of sorts, and, and under the floor there was pumped hot air, so everything would be continuously warm. Pompeii also has the first amphitheater that we talked about, the, the two theaters uh, placed together. And at first you see the uh, entrance into the theater was from these, uh, from these um, uh, double stairs, and one had to go up the stairs and then down. Uh, later on, they devised uh, very different, uh, very different uh, uh, schemes for for entrance of the Colosseums. Very similar, in fact, the Yankee Stadium follows the uh, the Roman Colosseum in uh, in the entrances that are all numbered with the tickets. But this is what the Pompeian Colosseum looks like 
right here today. These spaces, you know, are used still in the summer, the theaters, the uh, uh, amphitheaters. They're used in the summer for, uh, uh, for concerts, for festivals, for theater performances. There's a fascinating uh, fresco uh, that shows, in fact, the Pompeian Colosseum, and you can see, you can see the, sta the stairs, right here, the double stairs. And that was at the time when uh, there was a fight. There was a fight that uh, occurred between Pompeii and their neighbors, New Syrians, uh, during a gladiatorial game. And this fight, in fact, was, uh, was depicted in the fresco to the point people, people died. Uh, and, uh, and, and so the, Senate, the Roman Senate forbid the Pompeians to have any gladiatorial games there for a decade, but as you see, this is 59, and then in the year 62, uh, there was a, a great earthquake in Pompeii, and that's before the volcano erupted in 79, and, and after that, the games were again allowed just to bring back the economy. But, um, but you also see, you also see the so-called Valerium right there, and that was a cloth that was um, extended above the seats to prevent attendance from sunburn, or from rain for that matter. Uh, Pompeii also had, interestingly, two theatres. One is uh, your typical uh, Greek theatre, where Greek plays uh, or Roman plays were performed, and the other one is called the Odeon. And the Odeon was actually a roofed theatre, because otherwise the theatres were not roofed, but this one was roofed, and I, I mean, they could be used for anything. They, they could be used for meetings. Uh, they could be used for uh, for public uh, assemblies, but audio presumably was also used for for concert for for musical concerts. And here's another view of both theaters, and these are the remnants of the houses. The houses everywhere, and we'll talk about Pompeian houses uh, uh, soon. This is the uh, the uh, Teatrum Tecton. Tecton means roofed theater, which is what it presumably looked like or Odeon. The greatest theater were in Greece was in, uh, in Epidaurus, right here, and it is still very well preserved, and, uh, and performances uh, take place there on a regular basis, and that's where the Romans got the idea. Uh, the theater consisted of a caviar, right here, and an orchestra, and this is the uh, stage, or the ramp, where the performance could change, or the props could, uh, could be held. So originally, the, uh, the back structure um, it was very important because, as I said, uh, this is where everything got changed or the stage machinery was kept. And then the Romans brought it everywhere. The Romans, in fact, joined the presidium. They, they joined the backstage with the theater itself. And, um, and this, for instance, is uh, Roman theater in Colchester, right there, in England. So they, they took it everywhere. Uh, so as a result, we see the original Greek theater, Roman theater, everywhere, uh, not only around the Mediterranean, but wherever the Romans went. Um, and last but not least is uh, the importance of uh, the architecture of Roman necropolis. And uh, Romans, just as Etruscans before them, did not wish to have their cemeteries inside the city. They wished them outside the gates. And uh, so, but uh, so today, as one approaches Pompeii, one wants to walk around Pompeii and walk down these roads. It's fascinating because while civil architecture, official architecture, was a certain type, here is, uh, is where human imagination uh, just uh, was completely free to do as they liked and whatever they liked. There were no constraints on, uh, on structure. So um, this is northwest part of the necropolis, outside New Syria. New Syria are those people that fought with the Pompeii, and the gates towards that city were called the New Syrian gates. And you can walk around. I mean, these are, these are very charming places to walk around, and very beautiful, just very calm. The, uh, the crowds that are in Pompeii, they don't go there, so it's, it's really lovely to be by yourself. Uh, here's more, the Avenue of the Tombs. And then on both sides, outside the gates, uh, there'll be these, uh, these beautiful tombs. Here they are, and some of them you see are done as the, originally as a peristyle with the columns. Some of the tombs are truly monumental proportions and uh, often contains the re contain the remains of the entire family. And then 
they were very, very again they were they were faced with marble or decorated otherwise but very very beautiful and then in front of every one of them would be uh, would be stone benches sort of inviting the passers-by to sit down to read about the people who are buried inside the tombs and uh, you know to contemplate on one's own mortality or to sympathize with others and again frescoes everywhere here for instance you can see this the set of silverware which is uh, very similar to the silverware of the first century found in museums uh, throughout the world that uh, got their hands on the, on the Pompeian or Roman silver one way or another. Here is, for instance, uh, uh, an interesting tomb. It's the tomb of uh, Naibolia Taiki, and she was a slave. She was originally a slave, but it was possible in, uh, in Rome, towards the end of the Republic, uh, for a slave to do quite well and to purchase uh, her or his freedom, or to be manumitted by the owner. An inscription there, uh, it says there that I'm so-and-so, I'm a freedman of so-and-so, and he's my husband, who was also a freedman, and uh, they did extremely well, presumably. And, and, and so here she is, and, and she has a very uh, marble, beautiful mar marble tomb. And uh, so, uh, uh, there is a gathering of people, there is uh, her face uh, right there, and on the side you see there's a ship, and the ship has a female at the stern. She is the one who directs the ship, and that's presumably uh, presumably our, our Lady Taiki, right there. We actually finished our, our lecture uh, for today, and we'll meet and discuss it.